Welcome to the Public Safety Council meeting. Now we're going to have a presentation on the mobile crisis response. And I believe Stacy Brubaker is going to introduce her team. And do you have PowerPoint or is everyone just speaking, Stacy? They're just doing it on their own. <laughs> OK. Welcome. I'm Jen Inman. I'm the division manager at Jackson County Mental Health. And we're actually really excited to come to you today to talk about what we've been doing with our mobile crisis response and our partnership with Mercy Flights and Jackson County Mental Health, which is a couple of years in the making and a lot of community um, engagement and involvement in trying to find a model that would take our crisis response to the next space that was supported by our community and fit for our community. And so that's what we want to tell you a little bit about today. All of that work got us to a place where we had the relationships, we had the idea, so that when resources and regulations changed to give us the opening, we were able to take advantage of that. So Rick's gonna take it and walk you through a presentation and Spreen and I will make heckling comments from the side. So as we go, if there's questions or discussion, please let's have that discussion as we go. We don't need to save uh, questions for the end. But really, I do wanna talk about where, um, how things got started, because this isn't something that we just came up with overnight, um, and talk about some of the national, state, and local efforts. And then we're going to talk about where we are now, our partnership with Mercy Flights and their mobile integrated health team, and that's where Sabrina um, can give us some more in insight into how this fits in within Mercy Flights. But we'll also talk about how this was a community requested approach of how we've um, created this model, but it fits within national and state expectations. And then we'll end with the idea of what's next. What, uh, what's our hope for this expansion, as well as other community-wide uh, initiatives we're working on. So how we got started, it actually started about three years ago. Um, that's when SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the federal government, came out with their best practices, so their national guidelines for behavioral health crisis care. Um, and when they presented this to the, um, to the nation, it was really an understanding of how we need to have a continuum of crisis care and not just um, like we had a, a crisis line and we had crisis staff, but we really needed a more cohesive continuum of services. And that really started a conversation within uh, the national perspective of what do we need to do to create a more cohesive community crisis service array. And that created the crisis now. Uh, that's the model that we'll, we'll talk about here in a moment. Um, is that crisis now model. And you'll hear if anybody's heard me in other community presentations talk about the three pillars of what's important to have. Um, that came from that SAMHSA um, guidelines about needing to have someone to call, so a 24-7 crisis line, needing to have someone to respond, so mobile crisis response teams, and then having somewhere to go, so a stabilization center. And we're going to show a video that really helps understand that model. The other thing that happened um, really in a pretty quick timeline in the, in the nature of national initiatives is that 988 went live last summer. So 988, if you're not familiar with that, is the new national crisis and suicide uh, lifeline. Um, it's uh, kind of a revamp of the previous 10-digit uh, suicide lifeline. Um, this is an easy to remember number that is available nationwide. So if you go to another, uh, let's say you're on vacation in Florida um, and you need an ambulance, you know to call 911. If you need law enforcement, you know to call 911. If you need a fire response, you know to call 911. But you would have no idea what the local resource for a mental health response is. That's where 988 is coming on board with the idea to connect nationwide people into a, a response center that can then connect in with local communities. Um, so 988 is a part of this national movement to have mental health services 
more readily available and connected in on a local community basis. So how that works for us, um, so if somebody calls 988, you're going to get directed to whatever call center um, based upon your area code of the phone number you're calling from. There's about 225 call centers throughout the nation. Um, for Oregon, the main call center is Lines for Life in Portland. So if you have an Oregon cell phone number, then you're going to get connected most likely with Lines for Life uh, call center. But if they're not available, if they're busy, then that's going to roll over to the next call center that's available. But you should get connected with somebody within a minute. They have like some um, intro information they give as you're on hold and then you'll get connected with a crisis worker. If they need to connect in with a local resource because they're not able to resolve it over the phone, then that's when they would call our 24-7 crisis line and we can take it from there. Um, so the idea is that 988 will become more readily known, more readily used. People can call there as the one single resource and then they will connect in with additional community um, providers. But then that falls into the other components that are needed regarding the mobile crisis and a stabilization center. So this happened on a national level over the last couple years, um, which in the time of you know, federal government work, that's pretty, pretty fast. Um, but it's given us time as a community to discuss what do we want to have in place. All right, so a couple minute video here that talks about this crisis now model and those three different components. Imagine for a moment that a fire breaks out in your home. And in this reality, 911 doesn't exist. You might call the fire department directly, but they're not equipped to come to your location and only put out fires at the fire station. And the only people that will come to you in the community are the police, who though well-intentioned, are meant to provide a very different type of public service. This lack of a fire-specific response seems ridiculous, right? Of course we should have targeted services to respond to life-threatening emergencies, whether that's fire, law enforcement, or physical health. However, in many communities across America, life-threatening mental health and substance use crises are treated as an afterthought, receiving a response that's not specific to their unique needs. A 911 call dispatches the police, who most often bring the patient to a medical emergency room or jail or allow them to remain in the community but without assessment, treatment, or support. We have a patchwork system made up of elements designed for other purposes that doesn't have the capacity to treat the most vulnerable in our communities even though an estimated 20 to 25,000 individuals in crisis go to emergency departments every day in the U.S. So how can we improve? The only solution to delivering crisis care worthy of our communities is to build a structure specifically for mental health, substance use, and suicidal crisis that is on par with other emergency systems like we do for medical, fire, and law enforcement. By integrating three core elements, we can replace the patchwork fabric of our crisis care and develop a true safety net that can serve everyone, everywhere, every time. And in the process, we can reallocate wasted financial resources to places where they can have a deep community impact. It starts with regional or statewide crisis call hubs, call, text, and chat lines staffed by trained professionals who answer the call every time and direct people to the level of care they need. The onset of 988 is a great start. However, it will need to be supported by technology that empowers 988 to become an air traffic control for mental health and substance use crisis, enabling real-time coordination across the care spectrum. But a comprehensive crisis network cannot be built with only crisis call hubs. Additional services are necessary to ensure that a unified system of care is available when and how people need it. Services like mobile crisis outreach teams, 24-7 non-law enforcement mobile teams that go out in the community and deliver care to people wherever they are. This lessens the burden on law enforcement during situations where they're not needed and eliminates the anxiety people feel when a uniformed officer knocks on their door. And facility-based crisis receiving and short-term stabilization, facilities that say yes to every person that walks through the door, regardless of their level of need allowing them to bypass the medical emergency departments. 
This not only provides specialized care to these individuals with less waiting, it also enables medical emergency departments to focus on the patients they're trained to serve, while drastically reducing wall time for police when transportation by police is warranted. With these core elements in place, mental and substance use healthcare can move out of the shadows and into the mainstream. Together, we can build an unbroken system of care that connects patients from the point of crisis to the level of care that's right for them. To learn more, visit crisisnow.com. So that's what we are looking to develop, and that's what we've been talking about in the community. But I'm wondering what stood out for you? What were some of the points that made sense? Uh, this is Jennifer on Zoom, and I say that, you know, obviously reducing the burden to the emergency rooms is one of the high points um, for me. Okay, so if, if we're able to take volume off of hospitals and off of emergency rooms by a different system, okay? I think sharing the load, it's, it's adding that component that people in mental health situations don't have right now, so right. we're all sharing that load. Right, because right now the load is really borne by our law enforcement officers. Um, they are the 24-7 response in the community, whether it's the needed law enforcement or a mental health concern, they're typically the first ones on scene. Um, and really that is our, one of my main goals with this is that we are able to divert calls from law enforcement, um, that we are no longer needing to have them be the only responders and that we create this additional more trauma-informed approach for individuals who are in mental health crisis that don't need a law enforcement response. Our mobile units so that they can come to the folks as opposed to having to transport them for that first triage. Right. So being able to go to them, I, I love that description in there of the fire. Uh, they only put out fires at the fire station. Um, and sometimes that's how our mental health system has worked in the past. It's like, great, you're in crisis, great, come to our building and we'll see you for a session. Um, but the mobile crisis is the, the idea that we will go to them um, and be able to uh, help, whether it's through 988 or our crisis line, that they can get services. But if you need to be beyond a phone call, that we can go to them. Okay. Will the 911 centers be diverting calls to 988? So as we get to kind of where we want to get to, that's our, that's our hope. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about the fourth option, um, that beyond law enforcement, fire, and an ambulance, that we could become that fourth option from the point of dispatch that would truly take calls off of law enforcement. That's uh, still in the planning and the dream process, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about that. Have you looked at uh, the CAHOOTS program in Lane County? Yeah, and we'll, we'll be talking about Whiteford. Yep, we'll be talking about that um, as we talk about our local movement. Because as he's mentioned before, the conditioning and training of your dispatch center 911 to differentiate when an office should be required or a mental health person be required, is pretty critical. Yeah, and so we've had, I'll just touch real quick, but we will cover that a little bit more too. So uh, we did consult with CAHOOTS as part of this, um, as part of our community uh, crisis response network. Um, uh, they were involved in many of those conversations. Um, and so we built it really looking at what the CAHOOTS model brought, but looking at what our unique community could bring. Because um, their model is actually different from what we're looking to do. Uh, they are specific for two large cities, for Eugene and Springfield. They don't cover all of Lane County. They just cover two small areas, well, small in the larger county. Per they even just cover sections of the cities too, isn't it only like certain areas? Or is it all, I thought it was like the downtown. Uh, I, I think, I don't know, because I know it's Eugene and Springfield law enforcement agencies that help fund that, um, but they don't cover all of Lane County. So as we're in like, Jen and myself has been in conversations with other community mental health programs. Lane County is there saying we, you know, they need to develop a new system because CAHOOTS doesn't cover all of Lane County. But what we're 
working to do is cover all of Jackson County and not just Medford, not just Ashland, not just a certain portion. So it's a much broader uh, approach that we need to figure out how to, to do. Uh, yeah, other, so um, one of the things I liked about that video, again, is that understanding that this really needs to balance out, not just call centers, um, mobile crisis, but a stabilization center. And we're going to talk at the end here about, again, hopes and dreams for a stabilization center, because that's not something that we currently have in the community either. Um, and right now, the hospital tends to be the stabilization center. Pe people go to the uh, PCU uh, psychiatric care unit for their stabilization. And so uh, the hospital also needs some support for that. So as we looked at these different models, there are some other national um, publications that occurred in the last couple of years looking at kind of the a roadmap of how do you design crisis services really with that continuum in mind. Um, we started to gather community members together to have these conversations. So about three years ago, we started to bring together um, different law enforcement um, agency staff, um, city um, staff members, hospitals, CCOs, um, our community uh, substance use and mental health providers, um, those with lived experience. You know, we just started to gather people to come to the table to have conversations to figure out um, what did we want our community to have, uh, what would the services look like, um, who would do those services, and then who would fund them. Those were the three questions we had to figure out. And a couple years ago, we didn't have any of those answers. Um, so this crisis response network really was a grassroots effort to um, have conversations and bring people to the table to figure out solutions. So we have about 125 different community partners involved right now. Um, Jen's gonna hand out some information that gives more details on that. Um, so we call it the CRN, um, Crisis Response Network. Really the idea is that we improve the quality and accessibility of crisis response services for behavioral health, which includes mental health and substance use. Um, that's where we're at right now, that's our goal. But really where we started three years ago was, what is this gonna look like? Who's gonna do it and who's gonna fund it? Um, we went through some rocky periods of time. Sheriff was in on some of those conversations where those, you know, it was open to the community. And so community members came and they had their own opinions and they had their own ideas of how things should happen. But what we did during this time is we consulted with CAHOOTS um, they presented and talked about what their system, what their service looked like. Um, we had different um, listening sessions to really understand what the community was wanting. Um, and the community really came forward saying, we want a non-law enforcement or an alternative to law enforcement response that includes mental health, um, substance use, and physical health. Um, and so as we looked at what our resources are, um, that's where the partnership with Mercy Flights seemed to be, um, a, uh, for me, it was kind of a, a no-brainer. It's like that, we can bring them along with the, their mobile integrated health uh, and with our uh, Jackson County Crisis Mental Health staff. Um, and so we started with a planning committee. Um, we'd meet a couple times a month. Um, we've been doing stakeholder meetings, um, so inviting all 125 people to come and give updates on where we're at. Um, we've now moved to that being a quarterly uh, meeting instead of monthly. The other thing that came out of this is a community engagement committee. So part of the focus with um, these efforts was really to have those with lived experience be um, at the table and have a voice in the decisions that were being made. Um, so a community engagement committee developed as a part of this with those that have um, lived experience. Uh, some of them are, have gone through their own crises and either used our crisis service or the hospital or community crisis services. 
or they have loved ones, family members, sons, daughters um, that have used crisis services. And so they're coming with that, you know, real world perspective and giving feedback. Um, and they've been, I think, really valuable to understanding what it is that we want to develop and that we're not just um, taking our own um, perspective, but we're making sure that their voice is valued. So we have different uh, meetings with them. So our CRN, the planning committee, um, and the community engagement committee, we meet on a quarterly basis um, and talk about where we're going, get input, and, and help them understand what we're developing. So that's kind of where we uh, went from the local efforts. Um, but now to kind of jump back to some of the states. So this is a national best practice guidelines that we were following. We had worked with local community partners um, from agencies to those with lived experience to develop what we um, wanted here in the community. But at the time, about a year and a half, two years ago, we still didn't have the question of um, who was going to do this and who was going to fund it. And that's where the state stepped in with some additional uh, resources to help us um, accomplish what we've been wanting to do. And I may have Jen um, chime in with any of these aspects regarding more of the funding aspect, but the state um, passed a bill, what, two years ago now, House Bill 2417, that gave additional funds to community mental health programs to expand mobile crisis um, with an expectation that all communities throughout Oregon will have two-person mobile crisis 24-7 response availability. Um, they also are using some one-time funds um, from the federal government, from ARPA funds, um, as well as um, an expected future um, funding stream by having uh, an enhanced rate through Medicaid for mobile crisis services. So if we go and do a mobile response, we'll get a greater, um, we'll be able to have more um, revenue for those enhanced services for mobile crisis. Hoping that that will, um, through the increased money through the state for community mental health programs and this enhanced rate, that this could make this a sustainable model. Um, we're not wanting to build this and then have to have it fall apart in two years because we don't have ongoing funding. So that's part of what the state is also looking at is ongoing funding aspects. The other thing the state did is they started to talk about creative ways that communities could figure out what their model would look like. Um, in the next slide, I'll talk a bit more about that, about different models, different communities are doing and how ours fits in. Um, the state then has put together new um, Oregon administrative rules that govern the mobile crisis response. Um, and so we now have some guidelines and expectations for what we need to do in order to meet state expectations and what data. And the state is really understanding that these uh, mobile crisis intervention services, this is our transition year. Um, 2023, it's now an expectation, but they understand that there are some challenges um, in the workforce to be able to get enough people in order to expand statewide these services. Um, we've had a hard enough time um, hiring people and now we're com competing with every other community in the state who's also trying to hire the same type of staff um, and expand um, the number of staff. So we're working to, you know, actively pursuing uh, applicants for peer support specialists, for case managers, and for master's level therapists. Um, but it's a challenge. Um, I mean, my favorite restaurant can't get enough people to keep it open, so we're having a hard time getting enough people. Um, before I jump on, anything else you want to cover on state investments? Nope, you got it. Okay. All right, so let's talk about some of the models. So the state is really wanting each community to figure out what their model for their community is and not dictating that this is how it has to be done. So they're saying, you know, whether somebody calls 911 or they call 988, um, there is going to be a response is the expectation. Um, so 
starting on the far left, um, 911 typically will be a law enforcement, maybe a medical response. But some communities can do a law enforcement and mobile crisis combination. Um, or what our community has requested is more the combination of uh, medical um, and uh, mental health. So that's what our community mobile response model is pairing the mental health workers with paramedics through Mercy Flights. Um, we also still have the availability for just mobile crisis teams without paramedics. And there are sometimes, um, that's more of our follow-up model that we do further um, outreach without paramedics. Um, hoping the paramedics are with us on the first outreach and further follow up my team um, does. All right, so that'll move us into where we... I did just want to add that mm -hmm. that doesn't preclude that there are times that we do go back with law enforcement on that well. Yeah, good point. So, and that's actually one of the things as we get into kind of where we are now and where we're going. Um, there are still times where we will go with law enforcement. Um, somebody calls and um, we're not able to resolve it over the phone. If we're gonna go out in person and there's some level of risk, some um, known weapons, known danger, then we're gonna co-respond with law enforcement. So we will call um, and coordinate through dispatch with whatever jurisdiction needs to happen. Um, but, um, but let me talk about where we're at with the pilot. So with Mercy Flights, so we started this, so the. The CRN has been meeting for the past couple years. Um, was, uh, we had initially uh, discussed this partnership with us and Mercy Flights. Um, the community needed some more time to kind of come around and understand um, uh, what that model would look like. And so as we've now got support from um, the community, we started our pilot with Mercy Flights um, last fall. So we've been working with them for the last, what, six months, um, really with the idea of this is a pilot project. We wanna figure out uh, workflows that we need to develop um, and what this model will, um, will ultimately be able to grow into being a 24 seven mobile response. Um, so right now, if the, the way the workflow happens is when somebody calls our crisis line, um, our 24 seven, um, actually I have some other. Jen's gonna pass out some additional cards. And if you want extras for any of your agencies, um, we have a stack of them. I'm happy to give you these cards. So this is our 24 seven mobile, uh, 24 seven crisis line. Um, or they can walk in during our business hours to our walk-in center. So that's what's on the front. Um, if we're not able to resolve the situation over the phone, that's when we would have our mobile crisis team respond. That's when we would contact Mercy Flights and their mobile, crisis, their mobile integrated health team and they will co-respond with us. Uh, we're not yet to the point where we have the volume that we have a paramedic with us you know, all hours of the day. Um, we also right now started this pilot um, five days a week, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, we've expanded my staff. I have two, two staff on seven days a week, um, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, but we're still with Mercy Flights on our pilot five days a week. Um, Maybe one last thing. So the other thing on these cards you'll see, you'll see our information on the front. On the back, our local community resources for, well, there's the 988 number, and then resources for um, Addiction's Recovery Center that also has a 24-7 substance use support line. Um, and that's on there. That's part of the Measure 110 funds. Um, and then some other housing resources. Um, so maybe let me pause and let me give Sabrina a moment to talk about uh, Mercy Flights, their mobile integrated health, and what um, and what that is. 
Hello. So I actually like to start this off. We discovered this a few months ago. I'm going to start off with one question. And Sheriff, I'm sorry, you can't answer. And Stacy, you can't answer either. Um, when you think of Mercy Flights, what do you think of? It could be popcorn. Go for it. I like your airplanes and helicopters. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. So that's the concept we get all the time. Um, so whenever we, there's, when I talk about the mobile integrated healthcare program, it is a completely different concept. Although it's been around worldwide for 30, 35 years, um, the concept for us has been live since 2015. Um, as you notice in our pictures, we wear polos, which distinguishes us distinguishes us against all of our other crew members. We do not wear button ups and we do not wear flight suits. Um, the whole point of our program is more of a proactive approach and to reduce calls for services and to reduce hospital admissions, readmissions. Um, we actually have been had this program going since 2015. I have been lucky to be part of the program since 2015 and this is a natural partnership. So our team is built of community health workers EMTs and paramedics. We receive a significant amount of additional training in uh, crisis de-escalation, um, chronic disease management, um, mental health. The only, uh, how about this? The only thing we don't do is transport. And for an ambulance service, it's kind of funny. Our whole goal is to let them stay home and be successful at home. We do not want them to go to the hospital. We do not want to call law enforcement, and we do not want to call, call anybody. And you will only meet us if you get a referral and now if you have a crisis. So this partnership was um, a natural blending. So when we say Mercy Flights, we just can't take a normal EMT or paramedic off the ground because um, they love the lights and sirens. They love the action. They want to go fast. They want to save everybody. And unfortunately, um, in the last few years, um, we're kind of victims of our own demise. Um, we get 911 calls for lots of different reasons that are not emergencies. So when we started this partnership, um, we have been, I think we started off with very, very few calls um, out of the beginning, out of the gate. He's gonna talk a little bit about data, but um, our team has now been going through about six months of additional training. Um, luckily, before we started our partnership, we already had a significant amount of other training, such as motivational interviewing. Um, along with our EMTs, we're also cross-trained as community health workers. Some of you might be familiar with it and some of you might not, but it allows us to address a lot of the social determinants of health and the reason why people might be facing struggles or crisis or homelessness or substance use or mental health issues. Um, so that is why, um, that, is, that is our team. Luckily we have seven people on our team right now and again, as he mentioned, uh, Rick mentioned, we are struggling with staffing also. Because again, we do not have lights and sirens. Um, we drive a Subaru, um, Southern Oregon, um, and we don't transport. Um, we if we are working. We would if we do transport, it's going to be to an alternate destination, such as your primary care provider, um, crisis, or again, if we do ask for a transport, it's because we really do need one, and it's we've tried everything else in uh, under the sun to keep you home, um, and we do a lot of point of care testing and treatment in place. And we serve all of Jackson County. And so as we grow, when we're trying to get more and more on so we can get to the point where we're seven days a week, so. Yeah. Questions for Sabrina? Do they intend to go 24 seven? Um, I know in Lake County and Eugene, when the codes first began, the major problem was the majority of their calls weren't between 8 and 5. Most calls were between 5 p.m. and 8 o'clock in the morning. When the majority of overdoses happened, or when these situations happened, it required someone besides law enforcement. They also found when they first began the program that they tried to divorce themselves somewhat from the police department. That can't happen. You're your own two best partners. I was in the area for the initial discussions of the cost all of that when they first white bird first had the concept to start the this program uh, i wish you the best i really really do but don't separate yourself from law enforcement yeah and actually we're going to talk about kind of our next iteration that we're thinking of which directly talks about law enforcement and our, um, yeah and our team works quite closely with law enforcement enforcement yeah quite a bit 
we do d uh, deliberate two days a week outreach um, with law enforcement to try to get, uh, like I said, more of a proactive outreach to get them engaged with services before the crisis happens or before the 911 call happens. Again, more, more trying to decrease the calls for service. Yeah, maybe one of the things you talked about is, you know, we are not going, sometimes when people hear uh, that we're partnering with Mercy Flights, they think we're showing up in an ambulance. It's not. I've always called her program Sabrina in a super room. Um, and that's where we're, we're actually going in our county SUVs. Um, and if they're going to meet us on site, then they show up in their vehicle. And that's kind of what's in the picture there. Uh, yeah, we're not licensed sirens. Um, it, it's really staff showing up that are not, uh, not armed, no weapons. Um, but if we do need to have law enforcement come, certainly we will. And there's, uh, we actually had one. All right, I'm good. Good. Yeah. I'll give you one um, success story. I don't know. Um, I think it was a, a success in the way things happened. Um, that this person got what he needed in mental health treatment, and it was a really a great partnership. So we had a call from a dad who. Um, his son had just come in on a bus from Indiana, I think, and was here, was in a motel room, delusional, wanting to get an assault rifle and go and kill people who he thought were um, against him. Um, dad was concerned, um, but this was not one that we were just going to go with, you know, our, our lovely vests are not bulletproof. Um, so um, we called Central Point PD, it was in Central Point. Um, I had just had a CIT steering committee meeting um, a couple of days before, and so I called Lieutenant um, Abbott and said, hey, there's a situation. He said, all right, let me grab another officer. We'll meet you out there. So my mobile crisis team with Mercy Flights met out at the motel, figured out how to work with this individual. Um, a little bit of chaos ensued, but he did get under, he did go into custody, went to the hospital was put on a hold, was kept at the hospital, and ended up being committed. Um, so that process went from a phone call to a person ultimately being committed. That's not your typical calls. Um, our typical call is, well, somewhat related. Our typical, typical is family members calling because they're concerned about uh, a loved one. Um, but these are not ones that we're going to be able to get them to the hospital and get held. These are often situations where we need to help them get the motivation to engage in services. Um, our typical calls are not uh, unhoused uh, or homeless individuals. Um, it's typically we're going out to family members and trying to encourage people to get into services. Those that can get into services on their own can. There's open, there's Agencies were same-day walk-in services. That's not who we're working with. We're working with those that are, for some reason, are not able or willing to get into services. And so we're doing multiple uh, engagement uh, efforts to try to help them get into services. Um, our crisis team, we serve about uh, anywhere between 85 and 100 individuals a week. Um, right now on our pilot, we're um, going on about eight. Um, mobile responses a week and we do an, another eight to ten um, follow-up services a week um, we expect those numbers to significantly grow as we get additional staff and as we do additional uh, kind of modifications to our uh, workflow and that's kind of what we'll talk about in the what's to come um, all right let me pause and let's have jen if you want to talk a bit about what current funding where we're we at with funding sure so there, um, Rick mentioned earlier, there's been some enhanced funds or additional funds that have come through the Oregon Health Association. And that was in part uh, with some funds that the legislature set aside, some in investments that came from the state, and also some ARPA funds. And so those will be one-time funds, the intention of which was to help all of the community mental health programs in the state um, move things forward. There's a the new regulations, sort of like Sabrina was saying, require a whole bunch of new sorts of training and engagement for the teams that are going out. And so part of that one-time fund idea was to help figure out what those were, what the new workflows might be, et cetera, and to get us started on enhancing the workforce and growing the workforce. 
The other longer term strategy for OHA is to fund the service um, for those who are covered by Medicaid in any format with an enhanced rate for the service of crisis intervention services, particularly when provided mobile within the first 72 hours. So they have passed an enhanced rate to that particular service item. They tried to build into that rate um, the cost of being on standby or waiting for a call or being ready to go on the call. We'll see how that works out um, because the the call model or the response model doesn't really fit perfectly with a, a healthcare sort of encounter-based fee-for-service claim model, but we'll see, it's, it, we'll take it. Um, the other piece is that our pilot, our partnership with Mercy Flights that we were trying to attempt, while that was coming together, the state had not yet finalized the model that uh, and the rules around what we were gonna be able to use those funds for. So we knew we were committed to working together, bringing these two teams together because of the, how well aligned they were. Um, and we were invited through um, United Way, who's been a partner with the Crisis Response Network all along, um, to apply for a grant with the Providence Community Foundation. And they've funded the pilot for two years that started back in October. And that gives us some room to, to, to grow the pilot and to really look at what the pilot needs to do without having to make sure everything fit into whatever those rules were that were still in development. So it gives us some breathing room to fully develop this pilot and figure out how to sustain it longer term um, and to really see if those um, long-term enhanced rates are going to sustain the work that we need to do. And of course, we're all, we're both agencies are still hiring to positions to fulfill the need to do this 24-7 or to have more teams available during those, um, during the daytimes, including the weekends and the holidays. So that's the funding that's there right now. Um, we also have had long-term support from the CCOs in funding the crisis response for all of their members in our community. And those rates will also be enhanced as part of the Medicaid enhanced funds in the next year. So we've had um, throughout support from our local CCOs and um, again with the Providence Foundation and United Way to make sure that we were able to try this model and then prove back to the state how it works uh, and how we need to be able to use those funds that are coming. So that's the picture as everyone knows that's the picture for now and then we'll get into the next biennium and the next budgets and we'll see what that picture looks like. Well any questions on where we're at now before I move on to this? Um, so People call us, if we're not able to resolve it over the phone, we go mobile, um, working with Mercy Flights Monday through Friday. We do have other staff seven days a week. Um, we're, not, um, we're not to the point where we want to get to, but that's some of the things that we're looking to do is that expand our service delivery. So, <clears throat> uh, and I, I, I'm gonna talk about CIT here in a second, but. We had our CIT steering committee uh, a couple weeks ago, and one of the things we were talking in there is what could be this next phase of this mobile crisis intervention service model. And one of the things we're looking at is can we partner with um, a law enforcement agency <clears throat> that when they do get a call that is mental health related, can they call us and we co-respond with them so we can take that off their hand and they can go on to other calls. Um, so that's probably our next iteration with this is to, we're not quite to the fourth option yet, um, but starting to work with law enforcement agencies for us to start taking those mental health calls off of them. Um, but ultimately the goal is to work with dispatch, um, ECSO, for them to be trained in understanding which calls would be this fourth option in which calls would still go to law enforcement or others. Um, but we also need to have sufficient capacity to truly be available when that need is there. Um, we don't have the capacity quite yet with our staffing. They don't have the training quite yet. I have done some initial conversations with ECSO management. Um, but we're trying to <coughs> w slowly walk into the deeper end of the pool as we start working with law enforcement to take those calls off of them. Um, the, yeah, Josh. We regularly have people from the jail who are getting released who still appear to be in crisis. And historically, we've just had to transport them to the PCU and hope that all goes well from there. 
So I don't know if this is something you'd be capable of now or potentially in the future to give you guys a call before yeah. that decision is made. And that would be maybe a, a little bit different hat, but one of the hats that we wear in uh, with JCMH is we're really bolstering our forensics programs and jail diversion um, and probation support. And so you work with Taji Allen, that's one of the uh, efforts that she's working on. It's increasing staff in order to have that in reach to the jail as an effort of when somebody does need to be, you know, help supported, but the hospital doesn't necessarily need, uh, and that's not what they need. Um, so we're working with um, Taji and her team to expand those um, services as well. With some of the new changes to law, they mentioned Senate Bill 48, there are times when this decision is made in the first hour that somebody comes to the jail. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones I think I'm more referring to in this case where they've not been in custody, they're not a known commodity that we can help transition. They just can't be in jail anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, like I say, in the past, we put them in the back of a patrol car and we take them to PCU and we just say, there's no legal responsibility for us to have this person anymore. Right. Help. Yeah. And so it would be great. If yeah, so that's what, so Taji, um, this is one of the tasks on her plate is working with, um, we think of it as the jail diversion, right? If we can get them resources so that they don't end up going back again. Um, and that's uh, one of the efforts that her and Doug have been working on. So, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to, <clears throat> to that. I, it would be better if we could have this seamless op option to yeah. have the same same potential resource across the way. And that could be where we land. Um, there's, you hear we're kind of saying, that's, that's Taji's crew or that's our crew. It, it, it's, it's the same people. Because if we don't get them from point A to point B, they become the crisis call the next time around. Um, I just I don't think we're stitched together close enough yet, um, but we think about those folks all the time. Um, and, and we know the need is there, and trying to figure out what the solution would be. I mean, I guess at some point it's like, could we just call? Because there's plenty yeah. of people that will <coughs> leave our jail and be back within what an hour. 30 minutes? Yeah. Whatever the walking 10 minutes from PCU to where they're getting arrested. Yeah. Yeah. And that happens already. There are times you guys call crisis and we're aware and, and we can assist. Um, it's just a little bit outside of what this mobile crisis is, but it's still something that fits one of our hats that we're working on. Yeah, I think the answer falls in the last diamond that Rick is about to talk about. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's really what our community needs is the stabilization center. A place for somebody to go um, that isn't jail, isn't the hospital. Um, the idea of a stabilization center is that it's a 24-7 center, um, but the individuals <coughs> can be there they, 23 hours with the idea if you're there for more than 24 hours, now it's over, you know, now it's a residential setting. So you'll often hear us talk about 23-hour centers. That's what a stabilization center is. But if we had something like that in the community that was available, when somebody gets released from the jail, um, they're like, here, come here, and there's going to be food and a place to sit and uh, therapists and case managers and medical staff to assist. Um, or for law enforcement, when they meet with somebody and it's like, you don't really need to go to the hospital, you don't really need to go to jail, here's another option. Or for community members, if they have somebody that they're concerned about, bring them to the stabilization center. Um, so we know that as a need in the community, but we're still at that same point where we were a couple years ago of what's it going to look like, who's going to do it, and who's going to fund it. I and mean, we don't really have those answers at this point. We just know it's needed. Um, the state is looking at this as kind of their next iteration of funding and support for stabilization centers throughout the state. Um, I don't know that as a community we can always plan on the state funding everything that we want, so how do we as a community figure out what this would look like? So those conversations are still being had as part of the um, crisis response network. But knowing that right now our energy is going towards mobile crisis, but our vision is still to have a stabilization center. 
I apologize if I'm jumping ahead, but you know, mentioning it's a pilot program and collecting data to kind of prove its efficacy and, and hopefully have state and other entity funding. What's your like measure of success? Like what what kind of data are you tracking that states this was a successful encounter opposed mm -hmm. to maybe non successful? So some of, yeah, so the data question, I can answer it in a couple different ways, and that's, that is part of what our pilot is trying to figure out. Right now, we're just looking at numbers of, you know, how many calls are we going on? Um, the state, um, as they're landing on what uh, data components they're expecting, we'll have a component about what was the resolution of those, and so we will be tracking the resolution for these mobile responses. Um, we're also, so we're working, so through the grant with Providence, um, they have their um, Center for Outcomes Research and Evaluation that is helping us answer that question. What is the data, what do we need to, what do we need to collect, and how do we analyze that? So that's part of what we're, right now we're just counting numbers, but we know we need to go further and there's a couple different projects underway with that. Have you, have you seen, like with the crisis response and going out and locally responding to these events or these situations, have you been measuring like how often law enforcement is needed in those responses and opposed to maybe where that was diverted and that the, the mobile crisis team is the one that was able to find a solution there? Yeah, at this point, the calls are coming through to us um, and so it's not yet truly a diversion from law enforcement because it's the calls that we would have already taken. Um, <clears throat> I don't think we'll truly get a diversion from law enforcement until we get to that fourth option. Um, maybe the interim would be that we can connect in with law enforcement and they get the call from dispatch and they hand it off to us, maybe the interim. Um, right now we tend to call law enforcement, you know, rarely, but there are times, you know, this motel situation, right, we're going to partner with law enforcement. Um, so we don't have, I don't have good, a good answer yet of how the diversion is happening because it's not really happening yet. Gotcha. Yeah, I was going to say, when we kind of tried to hammer down on cahoots, when they were doing their presentations about their effectiveness, they really couldn't provide a lot of data for measuring effectiveness either, other than reduction of time for law enforcement spent with people. So as far as outcomes and things like that, they weren't necessarily that I remember providing like this concrete data points to support that in that way. More of an anecdotal response because I, I do know the law enforcement Eugene does appreciate being able to show up and either call mobile crisis and leave and go do something that's better suits their skill set versus you know trying to find resources for someone. Uh, so it's it's a welcome addition, but I don't know either. I, I just don't think that's established as to what's a measure of effectiveness yet for these types of programs. Yeah. I think like almost any kind of prevention effort you try to make, uh, you can't, it's hard to show in numbers what didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has been an ongoing struggle with these conversations at the state as well as to how do you show something is working. The other thing I just wanted to flag is that that we're really lucky in Jackson County because we have really great relationships with law enforcement. There are communities who the mental health system and, and law enforcement just don't get along and they are constantly pointing fingers. And I think that we're really lucky in this community. We've done a lot of work around that through the crisis intervention trainings and through all of the different efforts we have done throughout the years. So I think that puts us above some of the other communities because we do have those existing relationships and the fact that, that you know I can call Rick can call people we know who to call and we call them when we need them and the reverse is true as well yeah that was my example with Central Point PD right I happen to have Josh's uh, you know Lieutenant Abbott in my cell phone and I called him and he answered and came right out right so that's so much of what happens in our communities those relationships um, and maybe that's where I'll end off on is talking about CIT so um, for those that are not familiar with CIT, Crisis Intervention Team, it's a law enforcement specific training. Um, so I'm gonna, we're gonna do this quick video and then I'll end up talking about our current CIT efforts. Law enforcement officers are dedicated. Every day they put on a uniform and deal with everything from pesky kids on skateboards to bank heists. 
And while officers always strive to do their best, sometimes they encounter situations more suited for uh, social workers, like dealing with mental health crisis calls, which is why we have crisis intervention teams. CIT programs teach law enforcement officers how to safely de-escalate mental health crisis situations. In fact, law enforcement agencies that have CIT programs in place have reported as much as an 80% decrease in officer injuries during mental health crisis situations. Not only do CIT programs educate officers, they also bring together community members and mental health care providers to offer convenient options for treatment and to reduce the number of repeated calls for police service, saving officers valuable time. Take the next step in helping your community better respond to mental health crisis calls. Learn more about CIT programs by visiting nami.org slash CIT. Thank you, Nami, for letting me steal your video. So. Part of this is understanding that our mobile crisis response team, yes, we hope we can get to the point where we're truly diverting away and we can decrease the call volume on law enforcement. But law enforcement is still our main responders and even with a mobile crisis, even in Eugene with cahoots, right, they still have law enforcement that's responding. Um, and so CIT is still a valuable part of this partnership. So. Um, I think we're on our 12th or 13th academy. Um, how many years? Nine years? We, we started it in 2013. All right. In so 10, sorry, this is our 10th anniversary. How exciting. Um, so we are, uh, we haven't done CIT the last couple of years, something about COVID. I don't get it, but uh, we haven't hold, held uh, CIT. But we are holding our next one April 17th through the 21st. So for those law enforcement agencies here, um, please sign up um, if you haven't already. Um, and I'm excited, you know, every year putting together a CIT Academy, it's a 40 hour, you know, full week training. Um, we have some, I think, some excellent presenters. And that's really building that relationship and that connection with our law enforcement partners. Um, I think that is. You want to go on to the next one? I think that is it. All right, so we have a few minutes. Um, if there's any other questions or things we didn't answer, I'm happy to have Jen answer whatever questions that you have. <laughs> I see the floor back.